Hi everyone, welcome to the Paldatech Electronic Campfire. Today is Friday, May 12th, and this is Electronic Campfire, somewhere it should say it, 24. How's everybody doing? How, how's your week? How, how the heck are you? How's your cameras? How's your pictures? How's your editing? How's your zooming in and cropping? It is great to see everyone here. Let's start the show. Who do we have? Hmm. Okay, let me go back and look at the comments and see who's here. Wow, we have people from backstage. Eric, happy Friday. Mr. Jarble, thank you so much. That is awesome. I really appreciate the, the super chat. I guess they're called super chats. Um, okay, so we have Inscrutable Owl. Thank you, sir, so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And we've got Kenneth here. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you. Really appreciate the support. You know, I may get that teleconverter after all. Who knows? I wanted to get the actual Fuji two times teleconverter shoot with that, you know, with the, um, the 50 to 140 and then test that with the digital teleconverter. But uh, yeah, we, it, that may happen here. Who else is here? Dimitri, Tim, Pablo. Good to see you, Rob. Awesome, awesome, awesome. A lot of people. We are at, geez, we're at 100 people already. That's, that's a record for this channel. Thank you for joining me today on this electronic campfire. So we had a great show for you. Before I begin, I have been kind of nudged by the backstage people, the awesome folks at backstage who are on the Discord server, that I should mention it at the beginning of the show. So I'm going to do that. So if you don't know what backstage is, it is right here paldetect.com backstage. Check it out when you get a moment. It is awesome. We have a lot of fun and we have a Discord server. And this is what it looks like, actually. Um, kind of a fun place. If you look on the left side here, you will see all the different topics that we talk about, mostly Fuji, photography related, and all of that good stuff. So be sure to check that out. Um, and we do coffee time every Monday morning, which is a lot of fun. So Let's start with the first item right here today, and that is the significant, and I emphasize significant, rise in third-party lenses for Fujifilm X-Mount. I mean, listen, when I started this channel, one of the biggest videos that I did, and I actually probably put more comedy and work into that than any other video, was the Viltrox 85mm lens review, okay? so. For this lens right here, I put a tremendous amount of, of work and, and effort into it. And I kind of, it's funny because we take a look at it. So here, if you, if you can see it right here, the 85, it's so big, you know, I, I did this thing where I put it out in space. You can actually see it from the moon, the 85. You could read the focal length. But it was a, but my point is that it was a big deal at the time for a third party company to be making, you know, inexpensive lenses for Fujifilm. And times have changed. I mean, now I'm having trouble even keeping up with them. Viltrox has released what? One, two, three, four, five, six lenses, right? We've got, you know, Samyang. We've got, well, and let's go through a few of the newer ones that are coming out. Um, we have actually, let me pull this up here. 
So one of the things we have, and this was on a, it's interesting, a Chinese social media service called Weeb Weeblo. I think it's called Weeblo. Yeah, it was reported in Fuji rumors, but it's been all over the internet. And there's a company called, um, I'm going to butcher this. If I have any viewers from China, I sincerely apologize. Yang Yo, okay, um, it's it's uh, it's this one, right? It's this one right here. So we got uh, a, an 11 millimeter f 1.8, a 23 millimeter f 1.4, a 33 millimeter f 1.4, a 50 millimeter f 1.8, and whoops, that's Tamron, and a um, wait a sec, yeah. There it is right here, and I don't know what this one is, and I'm not 100% sure if that's for Fuji. If you, if you take a look at it, okay, just have a look at this right here. It's got, it looks like it's 12 to 35. Can you all see that? I don't know if you can see that. I think that's for Fuji, F2.8, um, but I'm not 100% sure. So, yeah, I mean, that is pretty special. We have... Tamron. I remember when we did the one, they had one lens out, it was like a couple of years ago, and now if you look at Tamron, check it out, 11 to 20 millimeter lens, f2.8, okay? And there's another trend happening too, and this trend may not be as, as good, <laughs> and that is, you can no longer say that third-party Fujifilm lenses <laughs> are cheaper because check out the price of the Tamron. We're looking, you know, at 829 bucks. I don't know about you. That's, that's a lot of money, okay? So, but this looks like a really good lens. And this one is available, I guess, for pre-order. Yeah. And, you know, it is, it looks like, you know, your, your standard Tamron, but obviously they've upped the glass. And if you check this out here, if you look, it looks like the minimum focus distance is 15 centimeters for that, okay? This is an f2.8 to f16 lens, all right? At the 11 to 20 millimeter, it's the 11 to 20 millimeter focal range. So this is third party, okay? But as I said, you know, this thing is $820, $830. So that's coming from Tamron. What do you think about this? And I'm not even done yet. I've got more lenses to announce. Let's take a quick break. Let me check the audience here. Who's here? We have, boom. Um, I got to close out the, <laughs> all the slides to see where I am. Okay. We are at uh, 165 concurrent people. It's growing. Uh, Mr. Conduct. <laughs> I like, I just, I like that profile picture. Very cool, sir. I like it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, agree, agree there, Mr. Jarvel. I agree with you for sure. For sure. But let's, um, let's check out just one more thing I want to show you. Okay. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Got to get back into here. PowerPoint, boom. I prefer PowerPoint than having to deal with, you guys have to wait. Hold on, let me go to their website and you're having to sit there for five minutes. Wait, hold on, I gotta, ooh, uh, I did all my prep work in advance, okay? <laughs> so we have the Voigtlander. We have two lenses from Voigtlander, a 35 millimeter and a 20, well, it's a 35 millimeter F0.9 and a Ultron 27 millimeter F2, okay? So this is the 35 millimeter F9, F0.9, sorry about that, F0.9 lens. Um, and there is the 27 millimeter. Let's take a closer look at the 35. Um, kind of hard to see it, but there it is, okay. See that little 0.9, so you have a real, um, real narrow depth of field. Uh, minimum aperture is f22, angle of view, 43.8 degrees. Minimum, they call it uh, shortest shooting distance. I guess minimum, it's 0 0.35 meters, I guess that is, okay? So those are the specs on that one. And then the next one, obviously, is the 27 millimeter. And it's like a pancake lens, right? Has an aperture ring. You can see it right there, okay? And then moving on real quick, <clears throat> we've got the Samyang 75 millimeter lens, that's about 500 bucks, but you're looking at an f1.8, okay? Uh, not bad either. 
I think that's uh, any other photos of this thing. Yeah. So that has a look. What's interesting is it has some kind of a custom. You see that right there? It's like an M1, M2 custom button setup, but it apparently doesn't have an aperture ring. Okay. So I don't know about you. I, honestly, I'd rather have the aperture ring than the, the custom switch. But what do you think about that? So that's what's coming. That lens actually. Um, Let's look at the minimum focus distance of that. And it looks like minimum focus distance on that lens is 69 centimeters. Wow. Um, interestingly. So um, there you go. Looking at a 9.1 ounce, 257 gram weight going down to F1.8 on that. So whew, you see what I'm saying? How many more third party lenses there are for Fujifilm's X mount? I mean, that is significant, and that activity is all within the past several years, right? So it's no longer a huge deal to do a lens review on a third-party lens, and it just isn't. Um, now it's and, and I didn't even touch upon all the other brands that are out there. These are just the ones that are coming, right? Okay, let's see who's here. Back to the... Uh, let me turn off the zoom. Okay. We got Robert. All right. Okay. Uh, greetings from Luxembourg. Who else do we have? Oh, I, I got to scroll back. Sorry. I've, a lot of people have joined. Van. Yeah, it is a good problem to have. It is absolutely a good problem to have. And one of the, you know, the criticisms of the Fuji system in the past has been there hasn't been a lot of third party lens support. And credit where it's due, Viltrox really took. In my opinion, Viltrox deserves, they took a big chance doing this. They stepped into the pool. I don't know if they were the absolute drop dead first, but they really embraced it and started putting out lots of different lenses, you know, for the Fujifilm X mount. Um, and I think we have, okay, so that, those are the lenses. Now, as far as other announcements, by the way, <laughs> got my little baby Yoda mug here. I think I don't, it's not even mine. It's, I think it's my wife's. Um, so we have the Fujifilm X Summit coming on May 24th. Now, I can talk about the new lenses as because the, that information's out already. I signed a non-disclosure agreement with Fujifilm. I actually going to, let's just say I can't mention what's coming at the summit, okay? And I can't even hint at it, but I think it'll be exciting, okay? And um, yeah, so we have that to look forward to. And I promise you this, as soon as I can talk about it, I will. But I take these things really seriously. You know, could I get more views on the channel if I let something slip out? Absolutely. I mean, I'd get a lot more views, but I would harm my relationship with Fujifilm. So, you know, can't, can't, can't mention it. Um, and I'm actually honored that Fujifilm would entrust me, you know, at, at, you know, with that information. So that's awesome too. But yeah, all I can say is there's a Fujifilm summit on May 24th in Bangkok. I will, of course, like everyone else, be watching it, and I plan on releasing some kind of an update once it's, be careful what I say, once it's concluded, okay? All right. <laughs> Mr. Charbel, man, thank you, thank you. Oh, we are at 191 concurrent viewers. This is, like, stressful. I can't believe this many people are in here. You know, I see that, and it's like, <clears throat> okay, so... Where is the summit? The summit is in Bangkok, Bangkok, Thailand. So, uh, hello, Harry in Berlin. Good to see you. Um, we got people from Portugal, Sweden, no, just everywhere. I think I'm going to bring a globe. I'm going to get one of those globes in here. I feel the need to internationalize this channel more. Okay. I mean, I have Hal, right? I have Giraguana, but I need some kind of a globe. I need, or flag, not, not flags, I don't want to do that, but like a globe with the world. I want to celebrate the fact that this channel really does have viewers from all over the world. I love that. I, I, that is my favorite thing about the whole thing in some ways. I love that. So that is awesome. Um, 
I wish I could speak different languages. I can't. But uh, I might have to start learning greetings in all different languages at this point. So, who else is here? Boy, you know, a map behind me. There you go. That's a good idea. Whoops. That's a good idea. That flashed away. Um, <laughs> so, Peter still loves his X-Pro1. Why not? Okay, when the X-Pro1 came out, you know, that was a a big deal you know again it's like these cameras come out and they're you know they're big deals they're huge deals you know the xt3 when when this came out okay when this came out right here we have light on it please thank you when this came out you know it was like it was incredible and then i get messages from people saying nah, my xt3 it's so outdated blah 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 Come on. No, it's not. I mean, seriously? Really? I mean, come on. You have, for example, right? It's, it's, look. Look, 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 look. See that? Do you see that? Okay. It's kind of like, it reminds me of that scene. There's a movie called, I think it's a, it's a basketball movie. I saw it a long time ago, so I might be wrong. I think it's called Who, Who's, Who's Years? Who's Years? With Gene Hackman. Anyway, he's, this team of kids from, I think, a high school walk into a gym to play some kind of major event. And he takes some measuring tape and he measures the height of the basket at the gym. And he turns to them, and, he's, and I'm probably misquoting it, but he says something like, it's the same height. Doesn't matter where the court is. It doesn't matter if you're playing a pro team or an amateur team or whatever. The basketball hoop is the same height. Okay? So... It doesn't matter. <laughs> exposure triangle is exposure triangle. Lighting is lighting, right? Yeah, you have a bigger sensor. Yeah, you have more resolution. But <laughs> this was a lot of resolution for a lot of you. And you know who I'm talking about. Those of you that have written to me frustrated because this is no longer the big thing. And this is. So just remember, they're both incredible, you know. And in some ways... Um, I, this is my most used, banged-up camera, and I still use it. I, in fact, this was used a lot to shoot the Fujifilm X-T5 review that I did. You know, the footage of the camera. So, I grabbed this. It's a great, it's a great camera. I love it. Love it. Part of my heart. Okay. Let's see. Camera bodies are not as important as lenses. Ah, you know, that's a good point. Yes. Absolutely. And... Dimitri, to that, um, I will add, as the saying goes, you date, you date, you go out with your camera bodies, but you marry your lenses, right? So I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in that one. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, Rob is right. For the past few years, it's like it's leveled out. And, and smartphones have done the same thing. I mean... You know, do you, how much different, really, I mean, if you really get right down to it, how much different is the camera on, you know, an iPhone, what is this thing, a 13 Pro, an iPhone 13 Pro versus a 14 Pro? Um, in fact, I mean, it is better technically if you look at the specs, but not as significant as it was when iPhone 4 came out or 4S. You know, that was a huge deal over the iPhone 3 and 3G, I think it was, or 3, I forget what it was. But now with cameras, it's a massive deal to, you know, they're exponentially growing with features, but these features, and I hate to say it, like digital telephoto, you know, digital, did I say telephoto? Yeah. These features that are coming out, with the new cameras, all the Wi-Fi stuff they're putting in them and the ability to do all this other thing, that, that all just layers on top of the basics. And the basics are photography. So at the end of the day, you don't need really any of that stuff. Is it nice to have? Yeah, of course. Am I glad that this has a larger sensor? Personally, I am, yeah. You know, am I glad that, you know, the video capability and the, you know, things like that are better? But you know, there was a time, I know some of you may not have been around, but there was a time, ladies and gents, and the rest of you out there, there was a time when there was no autofocus, okay? 
<laughs> right? I mean, talk to Ansel Adams, you know? Hey, the, the zone, you know, he made his own zone, if you know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, just keep that in mind. Okay, yes, I missed my Kodak disc camera, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the next thing. The two videos, we did two videos. One was on Saturday. It was the Fujifilm X-T5 review for the channel. Thank you so much for those of you that watched it, that shared it, that liked and did all the subscribe stuff. Thank you very much. That video is doing really well for the channel. It's, it was a, it, it, when I first launched it, it didn't do so well, like the first hour, and then it started to creep up, and then it, it's like something kicked in the YouTube algorithm, and then it went, so it's, it started to take off, and, and that was a nice thing, because that video, I was kind of a decision point for me with this channel, you know, am I going to go all in to this style of, you know, trying to not only review, but also inform, but also entertain, or what do I do? Will that work anymore in this era of limited attention spans, or so they say, TikTok and all that other stuff? This is a 30 minute plus video, you know, and it's, it's done wonderfully. So thank you for supporting that. And then the video went up today on the digital teleconverter. So uh, it was a good week so far. And we got some stuff coming next week. So it'll be, it'll be awesome. Oh, wow. We have another super chat. Bluetech 318. Thank you. Thank you. What? No autofocus, right? What? You know, and think about sharpness of lens. You know, I mean, come on. Is it sharp? You know, I mean, how big of a deal was that 40 years ago? You know, so things change. Things change. And you just have to get back to... You just have to get back to this. This doesn't change, okay? That's why I, I put it in wood, all right? It doesn't change. It does not change at all. And, um, you know, those are the fundamentals. And every single camera owned by every single one of you deals with that. Wait, where is it? Oh, deals with that. <laughs> okay? All right. All right, so... Let's talk about, real quick, I do want to mention something that a lot of people didn't catch in the video today on the digital teleconverter. And I don't know if Fuji saw it. So in case, because sometimes Fuji might see these live streams. So I do want to mention real briefly the issue that I have noticed with using it on an X-T5. I do not know if this issue is on the X-H2 or the X-H2S or not, but it is definitely on the X-T5. And I'm going to show you this issue. It'll take about five minutes. Those of you that know it, you know what I'm talking about, so sit tight, grab a drink or something. Those of you that don't know it and you plan on, you know, maybe checking out the digital teleconverter, this could save your butt. So, uh, oh, Tom, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Good to see you, buddy. Thank you. Okay, so let me plug this thing in um, and let's get to it. I have an X-T5. Doesn't matter what the lens is. If you haven't seen the digital teleconverter video yet, go check it out because I go into lots of detail about how to use it and comparing it to post-production cropping and that kind of thing. But what I want to show you is something that is a, I call it a bug now. I think it's actually a bug. No, it's not a bug technically in software. It's an oversight, okay? And the oversight is this. Whenever you go and you plan on, let's say you're going to, let's say I want to turn on the digital teleconverter. So I go into my menu, digital teleconverter, and let's say I turn it on okay so now i'm at two times i just took a shot <laughs> right just take another one okay so i've just enabled the digital teleconverter all right when i take a photo the way that it works is the camera saves two files to the sd card one of them is a raw file the other one is a jpeg that jpeg represents the zoomed in version that i selected in the teleconverter Okay, everybody follow me? Here's the, here's the problem, <laughs> okay? And this is a problem. If you go into the menu and you're up in your image, blah, 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 
And, you know, if you have it set to fine raw, you're fine. If you have it set to normal, you know, you're, you're fine. But if you go into and just set it to raw, okay, you're only shooting raw. If you go and you now you have the digital teleconverter enabled. So you go back. Let's see. Make sure it's enabled. Yes, it's enabled already. So you enable it. All right. Here I've got a 1.4 times. If I take a shot, okay, I don't get that shot. It doesn't exist. All I get is the one raw file. And as I mentioned in the earlier video, that raw file doesn't represent the digital teleconversion being applied. So it's the regular pulled back non-cropped version. And so I proposed two solutions to this um, and someone in the comments actually thought of a better one. <laughs> so my solutions were, come on, Fuji, either automate, you know, if I have it in raw and I, uh, you know, I assign digital teleconverter, then just give me a JPEG also, you know, just generate one and put it on the SD card for me or put a little message, right? When I go to a, you know, set the digital teleconverter, hey, you don't have JPEG enabled. That's another idea. The comment in, on the channel, and I think is actually the better way to do it would be to prevent the digital teleconverter from being enabled unless you're shooting at least JPEG, right? Raw plus JPEG, JPEG only. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. And that kind of goes against everything with the camera because the camera, the way these cameras operate, the normal way they operate is, for example, if you have your, you know, your focus thing set to manual, okay, if you've got it set to manual, right, a lot of menu items are grayed out. So there's, the camera kind of is aware at what it can do, right? It would be as if your car you drove to a pier, you drove to the end of a pier and your car said, your car just shut down and said, sorry, you can't go any further because that's the ocean and I'm not a boat, you know? So, the, the, but this can do that. This can think that way, except when it comes to the, the digital teleconverter. So that's the issue I want everyone to be aware of. And hopefully Fujifilm, that, that seems like an easy firmware fix. I mean, come on. So Fujifilm, please fix that. I mean, don't put it ahead of improving autofocus, okay? Improve autofocus, please. But make it like number 18 on the list, right? Of all, you know, <laughs> of firmware updates, please. And uh, let's get that done because it is confusing for new users. And the last thing you want to do is get back to your studio or back to your home. You stick the SD card and all you have are raw files. You know, you don't have it. Now, of course, you can edit those in Lightroom, of course, you know, or Capture One. And so if you don't know any, what I'm talking about, go see the video. Okay. Where are we at here? A lot of comments. All right. Hello, Carlos. I am glad you are here. Yeah, you've not ever been able to attend live. So good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. This is awesome. We have Zimmy. We've got Dr. Henninger. Great, 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 great. We've got uh, ba -ba -bum, Catherine Adams. Great. Yes, I love long form videos too. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, it's, yeah. <laughs> For those of you that um, regularly visit my channel, I, I finally just took down all the shorts. I just, I had to make that decision to go all in on. I, the problem for me with also doing short videos is that I'm kind of a perfectionist and I want them to be really good. And I know that the way that short form is, it's kind of meant to be just, you know, with a phone and you don't have to, but people are upping their game with these short videos. And so at, we're now at a point where if you're going to get into that, you need to do it right. You need to do it really well. You need to research it you need to build them and create them almost as an advertisement where you've got that hook in the first few seconds. You have text constantly appearing because people can't, you know, they get bored. So you have text. You have all these little advertising trickeries that they do in 30 second commercials that they're now applying to things like shorts and other videos that are under 60 seconds or under 30 seconds. So I decided I didn't want it to be a part of that. I just, it's not me. It's not what I do. So I just took them off. 
And, you know, and so doing the X-T5 review and the video today was kind of nice because those both did well. So I was like, okay, I have at least an audience that will, you know, appreciate those. Because you do hear a lot, especially from YouTubers, that if you're not jumping on that bandwagon, you're going to be left behind, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, um, and sometimes those things are true. I mean, if you're not getting into digital photography, you're going to be left behind. Well, <laughs> that was a, that was a big deal back then. Um, and now look, people are starting to go back to film. So what does Mr. Jarble say here? 220 on online and oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give it the like and subscribe if you get a chance. Okay. We have bum bum bum. Okay, on my X-H2, any questions here that tell it shows yellow arrow pointing to raw, raw JPEG, blah, 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 blah. I choose it and I do not see it. Wait a minute, what? Okay, on my X-H2 in raw, the yellow, right? Uh, but I don't see the effect on the JPEG. Okay, um, first of all, I don't have an X-H2, so my apology if the video I made this morning doesn't match that, but... You know, if you're choosing large, medium, or small JPEGs, and you are using the digital teleconverter, it's going to down them, down sample them, so to speak. So, like, if you have chosen a large JPEG and then you apply a two times crop, it's going to spit out a small JPEG. Not sure if that's the issue you're having, but I I can't help you because I don't have an XH2. I can't even pull it up here to to test that. So maybe if someone does have one, they could let let them know. Okay. Hello from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Good to see you. Oh, Sao Paulo. Huntington Beach from Jason Michaels Photography. Good to see you, Jason. Good to see you. Okay. So let's get on to the next subject, which I think is quite important. I'm going to put this question out there. I'm going to tell you some options and then I'm going to tell you what I currently do and then I'm going to tell you kind of what I have planned in the future. Okay? How do you store your photos? Okay? Or your videos too. Photos and videos. I'm, I'm kind of interchanging the two but for most of you maybe just your photos. Raw files are getting bigger and now with these cameras, you know, you can shoot in RAW and JPEG, you can increase the resolution, you have these large sensors, you've got, you know, medium format prices coming down. So, how do you store your photos, okay? Well, that is, that's changed in recent times. And there are, I think, six ways that you can do it, okay? So, number one is internally on your computer, right? Just on your computer's internal hard drive. I don't think that's a good idea. Because if this thing breaks or drops or you take it somewhere, you're, you know, you're at the airport and you drop it going through security, you've wrecked the hard drive, you lost your photos. Not a good place to store them permanently. Not a good place. It's fast, but it's not, it's not good, okay? So the next one, a connected HDD, that's hard drive disk. Well, that's good maybe for photos, but now that we have SSDs, you're really taking a performance hit. And plus with HDDs, you've got spinning parts, right? So I have so many of these broken drives that just wear out. And it's never a question of when your hard drive is going to wear out and conk out. It's when. No, sorry, I screwed that one up. It's never a question of if, it's a question of when. So yes, your hard drives will fail. And so backup strategy is a whole other piece to this. Right now we're talking about what do you do in terms of just storage. Number three is, you know, a connected SSD. And a lot of you do that, all right? That is a common thing that a lot of you do. And uh, I also do that myself um, in terms of an SSD that is connected, what I'll do it's, it looks like this, and I kind of name them, you know, and they're really boring names. So that's one way of doing it, connecting those things straight up. And then you have these drives right here, okay? So these are, you know, RAID drives. And now you're getting into redundancy, you're getting into speed, you're getting, you're getting into higher cost. 
But that opens up a whole world of possibilities, particularly if you're shooting video. And that's a connected RAID or a network RAID, okay? So a connected RAID is these smaller ones. They connect directly to your computer and they do offer some way to connect to your home or your office network so that you can see this drive on your home network, right? But at the end of the day, um, an, a full-blown network RAID is, is a, you know, that's like the big time. That's kind of the way to do it. And then a combination. And in some ways, a combination can be the worst way to do it. Okay? And I want to talk about that. Because whenever you have stuff scattered all over the place, like if you have a RAID drive and you, or you have a network thing set up and you're using detachable SSDs and you have SD cards laying around, right? Now you got three different places and that means that you, if you're doing it right, you should be backing up, performing backups in the cloud, yes, off-site, to all three of those, if you can. And sometimes they, you miss out. You, you, unless you have it automated, it's easy to, to, to screw that up. And so what I have found that's helping me more is to consolidate them down and have a flow process that's ironclad. You know, SD card goes into here. Then that goes into the RAID drive. Boom, RAID drive then automatically backs it up. I take the SD card out and I put it in a box called hold or storage. And then it sits there for at least a day or so because if there's a problem with the cloud backup or something crashes, I at least have it on the SD card. Redundancy. So how do you all do it? Because I, uh, I do want to get back to the RAID drive videos for photographers. It, I have the Synology units and I have a number of them that I've gone through the, the painful setup process for me because I, I'm not a network guy. So I had to really learn a lot to get them working right. And now I'm at a place where they're working great. Okay, they're working with Lightroom, they're working with Capture One, Lickety Split, and I'm not talking about just photos and cataloging, but I'm talking about, you know, multiple 4K videos streams that I can pull up, you know, from any workstation that I want in one central location that is also being backed up to the cloud. That's the kind of stuff, maybe on a smaller level, if you're not, if you're just doing photos and you don't need that much storage, but... I want to help because I think there is a there's an, a black hole here. There's an area of uh, there's a need for this knowledge, and part of the problem is it's so boring for most people. You know, ray drives. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just it is really incredibly boring. So what I want to do is you know get back to and I, I don't want to jump right into network raids. I am going to do a video on the connected raids, which are cheaper. And they kind of act like network raids. And so I think that that would be something that would help a number of you based on the comments that I've received. But let me know in the comments what you do or what you want to see or what you're confused about. Because there's when you're dealing with these backup drives, you're not just dealing with the hard drive. You're dealing with the operating system itself, like the Synology system that's in it. So you're, it's like going into another computer with Windows, but a different Windows. Or you're dealing with, you know, network crap and the right cable and blah, 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 and then permissions and file. There, It is a lot. And the idea is I want to simplify it. You know, I want to simplify it. So that's coming. Wanted to just, I want to just mention that, you know, talk about it for a bit. Whew. Okay. Oh, <laughs> it's that time again. Thank you. Boy, I was just ranting on about raid drives and my throat was getting drier and drier. And I'm thinking two things. My audience is probably getting bored because, you know, raid drives, who the hell cares about that? <laughs> and uh, my throat is getting drier and drier. And in comes this. Okay, it's Friday. Every Thank you, You're by on. the way. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, folks, we're going to have a toast. But before we do that, hold on. <laughs> I got to, I don't want to miss anybody. Yes, thank you, Blue Tech. Yes, yes, they're coming. They are coming. In fact, um, I have a vendor for one of those things. I promise, if you're watching Synology, I'm sorry, I've been busy. 
but it's coming. I promise it's coming. Uh, Natalie is in the house. Cool to see you, Natalie. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, everybody get a glass. Or a bottle. Or a, a shot glass. Um, give you guys a few minutes to do that. Let's see. An external SSD and Google, Google Drive. Okay, so... You know, that is another option as well. Google Drive, obviously Dropbox. Dropbox is, and I I no longer use Dropbox, believe it or not, because I have a Mac, and Mac has changed everything with how Dropbox works. If you are planning on getting into Dropbox, Dropbox is great, okay? However, if you are a Mac user and storing your data on external drives is important to you, Make sure you do your research before dropping into that, okay? Um, th th I don't want to get into it. We're going to get in the weeds on that one. But it is, there's been changes made because of Apple, not Dropbox. But Dropbox has had to accommodate Apple. Um, okay. We have, let's see, did I miss anybody's? I hope I didn't miss your super chat. No, I didn't. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> okay. On this note, first of all, thank you for the super chat. On this note, let's raise a toast. This is electronic campfire number 24. Okay. Damn, 24 of these things. Awesome. Great to see you. I hope you had a great week. Let's have a wonderful weekend. Here, as always, is to you. Cheers, everyone. One of the best commercials I've ever seen in my life, probably the best. I saw it on a TV in a hotel room in Kalgoorlie, Australia. Okay? If you're near a computer, go to Google Maps, pull up Kalgoorlie, Cal Cal I can't speak today, Kalgoorlie, Australia. It's right in the middle. And it's a mining town kind of in the middle of nowhere. And I saw this commercial on TV. And it was for Cooper's Beer. The Australian beer Cooper's, which is a good beer. And <laughs> th th these two guys are sitting, I think they're on like a, um, like a, a front porch. You know, and I, it, it's, an, it's an older man. He's like in his 60s. And, and then the young kid. And they're both sharing a Cooper's. And they pour it in the glass. And they're kind of like this. And he... The older gentleman, you know, looks at his, I think it's his son, and then he looks back at the glass of Cooper's, and it's filled, you know, it looks just like this. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And he, he takes a sip out of it, so I'll just, I have to show you, you know, to props here. Uh, he goes like that. And then he looks at the beer. He, he takes the, he, he does the sip, he kind of holds the glass out like this. And he goes, I've loved you since cocky was an egg. Cockatoos, which is, you know, they're everywhere in Australia, but cockatoos, the bird, they live a really long time. And that just had me on the floor. I don't know why. I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I've loved you since cocky was an egg. Um, I love Australia, by the way. If there's anybody from Australia, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and by the way, if there is anybody from Australia, Cooper's is not the best beer in Australia, Crown Lager is, which you pretty much can't get outside of Sydney. So if anybody wants to send a six-pack over to the Paldatech studio, it would be incredibly appreciated. I don't even know if you can do that, but it's called Crown Lager. Okay, who do we have here? All righty. What lens should I use on my... Hello. First of all, thank you for the super chat. What lens should I use on the X-T5 for a trip to Disneyland? Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, um, what lenses do you have? Definitely, I mean, I'm just going to say it. I think a zoom lens, because when you're running around Disneyland, you're getting on and off rides, you're, you're not going to want a prime necessarily, unless you've got like a, like if you already have a 16 millimeter and, and you don't own a zoom, then maybe bring the 16 and just do wide angles of everything. But a zoom lens, when you're going in a place like Disneyland, for me, is what I would bring. And plus, you might get wet on those rides. I think it's Splash Mountain. 
hang, you know, you go down that flume, you get wet. So, you know, I wouldn't be bringing really expensive primes to Disneyland. Um, you know, and the other thing is you're not, you're there to do two things. You're there to photograph it, but you're also there to be on the rides and have fun and enjoy it with the people you're with. If you're going purely as a photo trip, then I would bring, you know, a lens like the 16 or the 18 millimeter prime and maybe a telephoto prime. If you're going and you're just, you're going with friends and it's just like you want to get some really nice shots in a variety of situations, then I think the, um, the 18 to 55 millimeter for the fact that if you shoot video on that lens, you're going to have the stabilization on it and it is just an all around great lens pulled back. I think it's f 2.8. So it, you've got some nice background on it. It's a wonderful lens all the way around and it's reasonably compact. The 16 to 55 has better image quality, but it's much bigger and heavier. And I certainly wouldn't be banging that thing around Disneyland. So that's what I recommend. But hey, listen, anybody else have any ideas? Let her know in the comments. But congratulations. Disneyland is a lot of fun. Okay, so we have... Um, ba -ba. Yeah, again, and, and again, it's like with lenses, it, if, you're tr if, you know, if you're traveling, you do need to bring that bag of gear if you're bringing primes because it's just another thing to carry. And having, I used to live near Disneyland and I went there, you know, when my kids were zero to five, we had annual passes. And so people who lived in Southern California, you get this annual pass and you could just go to Disneyland. I had that down cold. I could tell you every nick, nook and cranny of both Disneyland and California Adventure, every single thing, best time to eat, where to go, blah, 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 blah. And believe me, I took cameras with me and I've just, the conclusion I came to was zoom lens one lens try and keep it light try and keep it simple um, unless you're going by yourself and you're going say at nighttime and you screw on a cinebloom filter and you're going to be doing all that you're bringing a tripod because you want to you know freeze it and kind of get the people out of the image but if you're not doing that go go light go lightweight um and the 18 to 135 also if you have that is will give you a heck of a lot of coverage yeah, I keep forgetting about the 18 to 35. Yes, that one too. That one too, for sure. Um, okay, so the, and you say you use the 35 millimeter F2. I love that lens. That's one of my favorites. Um, you know, that's a small enough lens that I think you could certainly bring it, you know, for character shots or people or things like that. But the, I think the focal length on the 35 millimeter prime is going to be too limiting for you for Disneyland. You're going to want something wider, okay? Um, and maybe, yeah, F2 is is good, but the 35 millimeter, I don't see you. You're also going to want something fast, and if you are shooting at Disneyland, you're going to be shooting in a lot of low light at times. So don't be afraid to turn up the ISO because it's better to get the shot than to have it blurry. Um, you know, if you go into, say, the Buzz Lightyear ride, there's lights in there, and you want to freeze sometimes that action. Sometimes you want to do creative stuff, you know, where you try and p you put the camera on one thirtieth of a second or even one fifteenth of a second, and then you pan with the motion, and you can get light trails and really cool things. So definitely, if you're going to Disneyland, you're going to be. I think you're going to be taking more photos at night. So prepare for that. Okay. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, the 16 to 80. Ben, good to see you. Good to see you. Bonjour, monsieur. Uh, yeah, Ben is, listen, Ben is the expert, okay? I just work here. No, Ben is, if Ben says, I'm sorry, but if Ben says the 16 to 80 is the one, Ben, you're right, okay? I'm, you're right. <laughs> okay, so, how are we doing here? Oh, my goodness, another, wow, I'm, um, I'm blown away with this super chat. Wow. You are, that really helps out the channel. Thank you. Um, I may now be placing that order for that teleconverter. And if I do, I will make the video on it, comparing it. I think that was the one thing I, when I made the video, I was like, damn it. I, mm, I didn't test that, you know, and at some point you, at some point you have to just cut things off and say, I've tested enough. And, um, or, you have to know when to shut up. <laughs> Guilty is charged. You have to know when to shut up. And I noticed when I was editing the digital teleconverter video, 
I started going on and on and on about field of view. And I looked at it and I looked at the fact that the video was 13 minutes long already. Not that that's a big deal for me, but still. And I'm looking at that going, really, maybe I'll trim that out. There's so much stuff that's on the cutting, cutting room floor that I shoot. I'd say I cut, well, here's, here's an example of how much I cut out. The X-T5 review took me eight and a half hours to shoot just the studio segment. Okay, that's just... Hi, everyone. Welcome to... You know, that's it. Okay, just the studio segment. And not the testing, not all the footage, not the B-roll, just the studio segment. Eight and a half hours. That, that took me the time to... I had to stop. I had to reset things up. I had to check notes. I had to test something. I had computer problems. So, you know, then that gave me four hours and 16 minutes of raw footage from the camera and it was from one two three cameras so three cameras times four and a half hours so four times three hours of footage which then that doesn't include the screen recording footage there okay there's there's another four and a half hours so four and a half hours say roughly four and a half hours times four okay by the time i finished editing it it went down to 30 minutes 30 minutes and it wasn't like I had all these really bad takes <laughs> I, I did but it a lot of the stuff was cut out because what I do and this is my secret with YouTube videos if anybody wants to start a YouTube channel this is a secret what I do is when I make the first cut and I've gotten it tightened down to the story I want to tell. Because every video that I make is a story, even if it's education. I, I approach it as a story. So I have a story, rough cut. I always go back and start watching it again. And I, the minute I see something that I need to fix, change, alter, you know, if it's graphic in the wrong place, whatever, I stop. I fix it. And then I go back and start it over from the beginning. And then I continue and I go back and I start it over from the beginning. I stop and I go back and I start and I keep doing that until I can get through the entire video without stopping to go, oh, mm. if it makes me feel weird or bad or if there's a mistake that I've made, particularly if there's a mistake, you know, if I say millimeters instead of centimeters, I will never hear the end of it ever. I will get comments about that until the end of time. In fact, I will die. I will be dead and buried. And on some YouTube channel, some, <laughs> some you know, somebody's going to say, you said centimeters, it's millimeters. You know, so you have to check these things. You, you really do. And it's, it's different now. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we got, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm taking up too much time. I want to get back to you folks. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. All right. Um, let me just pull up this computer. Hold on a second. All right. We're good. I'm right at the border between this pair of glasses and this one. This one, I can actually see the screen in the comments perfectly, but I like how these look better. So I'm like squinting. I'm probably going to give up at some point and have to use these. You know, I'm sorry about that. But I'm, I'm like really trying here. <laughs> Okay, uh, wait, 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 hold on, there's a great question here from Gordon, good to see you. So Gordon asks, hey Chris, do you have a limit of the max ISO that you are shooting with? <sighs> no, I don't set limits on anything. Now for auto ISO, no, I don't even do it for auto ISO, no. And, and I'll tell you why, I mean, I'm always looking at the ISO and I'm always trying to bring it down as much as possible. Okay, but I've gotten to a place now where if it's a choice of blurry shot or really high, ridiculously grainy ISO, I'm going to go for the high ISO. Okay, you know, the one setting that, you know, if I, if I had to say don't even bother with is the 56,000 ISO, the extended ISO, but any native ISO, um, I pretty much, because you have all of this AI software, you've got Topaz, you have Adobe getting into the game. So I hate to say it, but having higher ISOs is becoming f more fixable than it used to be. Um, I would say, though, for professional work, for product stuff, portraits, things like that, you know, when you get above that 3200, <laughs> that's when things start to happen, particularly if you're out with wildlife shooting, I've noticed. In darker foliage, you get above that 3200. 6400 is a mixed bag. So 
you know, if I had to say you want absolute no noise, really great images, keep it below 3200. But I always say don't restrict yourself, which is why one of the first things I turn off on this, this camera is, I think there's a setting on here that doesn't allow it, uh, I have to go back, but there's a setting that prevents the camera from taking the shot unless it's in perfect focus. And I, that never sat well with me um, because, you know, again, I'd rather have even an out of focus shot than no shot. And I know that some people actually use that as part of their autofocus technique. That never caught on with me. But there is a setting on the cameras to prevent the camera from actually taking the shot. And there is sort of with auto ISO, because with the maximum ISO, but the camera's gonna try like hell and it's gonna do the worst thing imaginable is raise your shutter, I'm oh, sorry, lower your shutter speed. And that's a nasty thing to happen if you're not expecting it, okay? I can't tell you how many photographs I've ruined because the damn camera, I have it in auto ISO, I wasn't thinking, imagine that. And I take the shot and I go and I look at it and it's like, it's it's soft, it's fuzzy. It's not out now blurry. It doesn't look like you've had you know six of these, and it's it's blurry. It's it's just soft, and I, and I just I'm like, why? What the hell am I doing wrong? Why am I such a lousy photographer? And the reason for that is because the auto ISO kicked in, and I had a really long focal length lens. So for example, I've got 140 millimeter focal length, and if the ISO the, the shutter speed drops down to say one one hundredth of a second and you're shooting at 140 millimeters, you're probably going to have a soft image if you're not careful, especially if you don't have IBIS. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I, again, for all those reasons, I keep auto ISO to allow the camera to take to borrow from, I call it the ISO bank, right? Because I don't want to make any withdrawals from the shutter speed bank. I want that like Fort Knox. If I set my shutter speed, I damn it, I want that set, okay? And kind of the same thing with aperture. ISO, you can, you know, you, you can play with a little bit. I hope that answers your question. Okay, and good to see you, Carlos. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 you know, me too. Um, I am, as I'm getting older... My hands are getting shakier. I don't know if there's a correlation. I'm just saying. And I've noticed that I'm really digging Ibis a lot. Ibis has saved my butt a lot. Remember, though, remember, though, Ibis doesn't do anything for you if your subject is in motion, right? So, you know, Ibis is only good for this. It's not good for this, right? So just remember that. It's not the end-all, be-all, cure-all of fixing any kind of motion blur, only camera motion blur, okay? Okay, we are at, geez, we went over today. I actually, I, we went over, that's okay. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't keep a time schedule, I, I blew it. I got so involved in chatting with you. Sorry about that. Okay, so we are gonna be going, um, yeah, rapidly moving kids. That's, let me tell you something about that one. If, <laughs> If anyone is thinking about photographing children, particularly if they're yours, okay? Well, I could talk for an hour on that. I'm, not, I'm really gonna try not to mention stuff because I could talk for an hour on that. I got some really important stuff to say and I have a video that I started the script two years ago. I, fin I wrote about uh, three quarters of it. I, I contributed to it a year ago and then three months ago, I'm almost done with it and that's gonna be a video, how to photograph your children. It's a big one and it's a personal one. So that's coming too. But I'll tell you right now, with regard to camera shake and all that, with kids, I wouldn't dream of putting the shutter speed below one five hundredth of a second. Okay? Yeah, I mean, can they sit still for a minute? But the problem, not the problem, the wonderful thing about kids is how spontaneous they are. So if you're photographing your kids, yeah, one minute, you know, they might be... One, one minute, they might be sitting on the couch reading, you know, memories of Jaws. You know, they might be doing that. And then, and they're sitting still. They're sitting still. Oh, wonderful. That's just great. 
I can, they're sitting still. I have, uh, oh, I don't have IBIS on this one, but okay, I can drop this thing down. I can lower this. Wonderful. I can shoot them at even 1 60th of a second, maybe even 1 30th. However, kids jump up a lot. They move around and you will miss that moment if you, oh, wait, uh, uh, if you go to that shutter speed dial, you're going to miss it. So I just kind of assume that when I'm shooting kids, particularly mine, I'm going to have slightly grainier photos. And the only other thing I'm going to say about this right now is don't worry about it. There, you know, there's Topaz AI, but the big picture is this grainy or not those photos that you're going to be taking of them are going to become the most important thing in their lives. What they will be what those kids would take with them if their homes were on fire, right? When they become adults and, and older, older adults. All right. So don't worry about the grain. Okay. Josh Morgan from Canada. Awesome. <laughs> Using he's rocking the, uh, whoops, I'm clicking on the thing there. I got to do it from here. Uh, okay. Rocking the uh, X-H1 and the X-T1. Good for you. Why not? You know? Listen, if you're rocking a brownie Kodak camera, cheers to you. Okay, and with that, I'm going to do one last sweep through here. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. You know? Um, I try and keep these streams short. But I'm going to do one in two weeks and, um, you know, I'll, and I'm starting to remember who's asking questions. So be warned if I see the same people asking questions next time, I might kind of go over them and go to someone different and new because I want to try and get to everybody, of course. Um, nothing personal, but I do want to include everybody. It's really hard to do this stuff. Trust me. Okay. So, um, this one's awesome. I'm going to end on this note. Thank you so much. I think I need to fix that text. It's really small. I don't know if you can see it. It's small for me. Um, thank you for stopping by. Did I have anything else? No. Um, trying to think of upcoming videos. Ooh, we got the Fuji Summit. I can't talk. Of, okay. I can't talk about upcoming videos, really. So um, let's just say that I will be, I will see you next week in a video and the next live stream. Why don't we do that? Let me pull that up so you can put it on the calendar. We're going to get organized here, right? Put it on the calendar. It is in going to be in two weeks. Can't get the calendar app to open. Okay. <laughs> uh, the May 26th. Okay. So the 20 Friday, the 26th of May, 5 PM Eastern time will be the next live stream. All right. Thank you all for joining me. And um, yeah, yeah, make sure I don't miss anybody. Everyone can ask the people on Discord. So helpful. Yes, I do want to mention Discord again. I, I've got to mention Discord again. And the reason is that Discord is a place that is, you know, um, that's Discord. See the topics. Yay. Discord is part of the Palatech backstage. And I purposely didn't want to just open it up when I first started it as a, as a public forum because I, to do it right, to do it publicly right would require a heavy set of moderators and time that I can't do right now with where I'm at with the channel. So it is, you have to, you have to join backstage or you have to join the YouTube channel membership to be on Discord. Um, but it is great in that everyone there has such great spirit about them and real civil it is it's like a it's just a breath of fresh air so thanks to all of you that are on the discord server um and making it as wonderful as you do i really appreciate it okay everyone um that is all for today i'm gonna go ring in the weekend if you liked this video of course be sure to give it the like and subscribe and yeah I think we did good today. We, we went over time, but we talked about some good stuff. And as always, thank you for supporting the channel. I love having you here. Take care.